evening. Welcome to Hunter College. Welcome to Roosevelt House. I'm Elizabeth Marcello. I'm a doctoral lecturer here at Roosevelt House. I'm very pleased to be joined tonight with Alan Malik, who you are obviously all here to see. He is a senior fellow at the Center for Community Progress in Washington, DC. He's the author of many works on housing, planning, and cities, including Bringing Buildings Back and the Divided City, Poverty and Prosperity in Urban America. He has served as Director of Housing and Economic Development for Trenton, New Jersey, as a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and as a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. So please join me in welcoming Alan Malik. Thank you, Liz, and good afternoon or good evening, as the case may be. This is far too nice a day to be spending indoors. I think what I'm going to be talking about is important. Hopefully, you'll find it interesting and challenging and will provoke some thoughts on your part. So without further ado, this, I'm going to talk about smaller cities in a shrinking world. I'm going to start out the f by talking very globally about what as I believe is likely to happen over the next few decades and then how this is likely to affect cities. And just a spoiler, not good. And then talk about how cities can deal with the challenges that they're going to face, that they are not doomed and are not fated to sort of wither away, that there are real opportunities at the same time as their challenges. So first, to go a little bit of history, many of you look like you might remember this book. 1969, a man named Paul Ehrlich published The Population Bomb in which he argued that the world was already vastly overpopulated. It was no longer able to feed the population. Millions, if not hundreds of millions of people would starve over the, within the next decade. And that the only way to address this was through a massive effort of population control, including coercion if necessary. Well, short answer is he was wrong. What happened, and we've only really started to see it in the last couple of decades, is that there has been an all but global slowdown in population growth to the point where at this point, the most sophisticated demographers expect the world's population to start to decline some point within the next roughly 50 years after peaking at somewhere between nine and a half and 10 billion people. It will then start to go down. In fact, if we look at the world generally, countries fall into four basic patterns. There's a huge mass of more or less contiguous countries in Asia and Eastern Europe that are already losing population at a significant pace, and these are countries that contain about a quarter of the world's population, including China, Russia, Japan, Korea, and a half a dozen or so European countries. There's a second tier, which includes Western Europe and pretty much all of the Anglophone countries, United States, Canada, Australia, and so forth, which are basically in negative growth in terms of the demographic change, meaning the birth-death ratio, but to the extent that they take in immigrants may continue to grow for some time yet. It's a third group, which includes Latin America, South Asia, which is where population growth is slowing down at a rapid pace and will go into negative demographic growth probably within the next 30 or 40 years. And that includes, by the way, India, which is likely to peak its population and start declining within about 25 years. Contrary to what many people may believe, birth rates in India are now below what is known as the replacement rate, which is the rate at which the number of births are adequate to keep the population stable. 
then the only parts of the world which are likely to continue growing beyond the next couple of decades are sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. I mean, population, birth rates are slowing down there as well, but not at a pace that will lead to decline anytime soon. So it's important to stress, this is not just about the global north, the developed countries like the United States, Europe, Japan. It's a global phenomenon. And the United States is very much in the same boat. And this is, you know, this is a, a reasonable projection of the United States' population, suggests that within the next, oh, five to 10 years, we will go into negative growth demographically in terms of having more deaths than births. And at that point, growth will only exist to the extent that we have immigration. And if immigration continues at the average rate of the last few decades, then we will still go into negative growth, but it'll be pushed back by 15 or 20 years. Now, the thing about all of this, and I want to stress this, because we, if, if you're interested in this stuff and you read the magazines and the blogs and the websites and so forth, you will realize that there is a constant stream of stuff from the United States, Japan, Europe, and so forth about how we have to do X or Y to reverse this trend and have more babies and increase the birth rate. And all of that stuff is basically, to use a technical term, nonsense. The, the, the thing is, at this point, we have data on just about every possible intervention in multiple different cultures and countries over many decades. And one thing that seems to be a constant, if you have four things happening, greater prosperity, greater urbanization, access to contraception, and perhaps most importantly, women's access to education and job opportunity. If you have these four things coming together, as you do in almost every country that is a developed nation and many that are moving in that direction, birth rates go below the replacement rate. Now, you can do a lot of things which are probably good things, like providing free or subsidized childcare, extended parental leaves, family allowances. These are good things for society, but as far as affecting the birth rate, the effect is at most a small blip. France spends 4% of its GNP on measures to try to increase births. The birth rate in France, the fertility rate in France, is 1.8, which is well below the 2.1 needed for replacement. Now, it's possible if they didn't do all the things they did, it might be 1.5 or 1.6, but it's not enough. So I'm not, so I'm talking about something that seems to be hardwired. Now, that's the beginning of it. Now, the second thing is that as birth rates slow down, population distributions change. At this point, the country that's furthest along in this process, which is Japan, 30% of the country's population is over 65. In the United States, we've gone from 5% during the 1950s to 17 or 18% now. We will be in the mid-20s over in a couple of decades. The growth of the population is going to be concentrated in older people. Elders rule. <laughs> but this is not, I mean, this is, in many res respects, this changes the whole dynamics of a society. You have a smaller working population, far smaller number of children coming up, and a large elderly population who have different needs, different consumption patterns, and so forth. So that's the first part, the demographic change. The second part, of course, which is a wild card, 
is what happens with migration. So if the United States decided tomorrow that it would admit, if not everybody who wanted to come to the United States, a significant number of them, we could continue to grow our population indefinitely. Politically, that's not very likely. But the other thing to know is that we, there is also internal migration that goes on. If you look at the United States, for example, all of the brown counties, this is a map of counties, all of the brown, both the very dark brown and the medium brown counties, lost population since 2000. That's a huge part of the country. Now, admittedly, it's a, for the most part, less populated part of the country. But that's part of the point. There is a massive, almost gravitational pull from rural to small city to large city going on. In Japan, which again is the canary in the demographic coal mine, the, the only growing regions in the country are the Tokyo region, the Osaka-Kyoto region, and the Fukuoka region in the South Island. Every other region in the country, every other prefecture to their equivalent of state is losing population. There's a massive pull towards the center. On top of this, we have climate change. Now, nobody can predict the exact contours of climate change. We get, we, we get some new surprise almost every week. But one thing we know that is going to have major effects, we know that, not, that what we're doing today is not going to significantly mitigate the effects of climate change over the course of the next few decades, whether it has to do with natural disasters, rising sea levels, heat, desertification, and all of these have extraordinarily powerful effects on economic life, whether it's productivity, whether it's gross domestic product, whether it's just economic activity generally. Climate change is going to have a negative effect across the board. Now, maybe not some countries. Canada, for example, may actually come out looking pretty good. Scandinavia may. You know, after all, there are lots of countries, lots of places in the world where they'd be just as happy to have a little less snow. But overall, climate change is going to have a negative effect on economic life, on social life. And this is compounded with two other things that are extremely unsettling. The first is the seeming collapse of the semi-stable, you might say, global order that has existed in the world for the past close to 100, at least since the end of World War II, and the fragmentation of new blocks forming, shifting, changing in ways that are hard to predict, but ultimately extremely problematical. The second part, which co goes along with this, is deglobalization. I mean, globalization and is a complicated phenomenon that has its advocates and its detractors, its pros and its cons. And I, last thing I want to do is get into a discussion of the pros and cons of globalization. But it has provided the framework for economic life in the world for at least the last 40 years, if not longer. And it's clearly disintegrating. And ironically, one of the major actors in the process of deglobalization is the United States of America currently. And again, I'm not sure whether there, that's good or bad, but it's happening. And this is going to have huge effects, again, on economic life. So when you put all these together, how is this going to affect people's lives? The first thing is, and I don't want to walk through all of this. I could spend easily an hour just on this chart. But the point is that all of these things are going to be creating a series of negative economic, environmental, and social effects, increasing instability, 
and reducing growth. And that, of course, if left to its own devices, can create a whole series of additional problems. One thing we know, which is painful, is that gr the less growth you have, the more inequality you get. That redistribution is basically, in human societies, is basically an outcome of growth, which is logical enough, because if people have more, they're inclined to share some of it. If they don't, they're not likely to dig into what they have already. That means we're going to have more con geographic concentration of wealth, resource hoarding, reduced capital investment, and a lot of things that are all going to have a powerful impact on cities and urban life. And again, the ones that are going to be hit hardest are the smaller cities, the peripheral cities, the cities that are already essentially, you might call them pawns in the globalized economy. New York will probably do fairly well. New York will glom on to a larger and larger share of the national and international resource base. But peripheral cities will not, and one of my Favorite examples is a city called Peoria, Illinois, which epitomizes this. Peoria is a fairly prosperous, small industrial city in central Illinois. It is, its economy is totally dependent on a cluster of caterpillar factories, which are, of course, an, an export industry totally dependent in turn on a global market for the product. If that market disappears, or if Caterpillar decides that they can make their stuff somewhat less expensive, say in Luanda or Asuncion, they're going to go. At the same time, Peoria is surrounded by hundreds of square miles of some of the best farmland in the United States. With the exception of a couple of hobby farms, every square inch of that land is being used to grow corn and soybeans for a global market. At the same time, everything Peorians eat is imported from the global market. Peoria is a total captive to globalization. And there are hundreds of cities like this in the United States. And the, now, if, as in the case of Peoria, you have the assets of this productive farmland and the caterpillar families, factories and so forth, you can actually thrive up to a point from globalization. Peoria is not wealthy, but it's not poor. But it's totally at the mercy of what happens elsewhere. It has no control over its future, and for the reasons that I've discussed, its future unless it starts rethinking its basic business model, you might say, its future is fairly grim. Because one thing which is inevitable, I mean, the United States has dozens, if not hundreds, of shrinking cities already, even though national population has grown. As national population growth slows down, there are going to be more and more shrinking cities in this country, as there already are. If you look at countries like Japan, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth, the vast majority of cities in these countries are already losing population. So we're headed in that direction. But, and the reason that matters is that shrinkage is not just a number. It has effects on the economic, demographic, fiscal, and environmental character of the community. It creates, there's less economic activity, disinvestment, lower property values, greater poverty, vacant buildings, vacant land, excess infrastructure, fewer tax revenues, etc. All of these work against shrinking cities under the current business model. And as <coughs> we all know, cities, whether, they, whether we're talking about small cities like Johnstown, Pennsylvania, or Gary, Indiana, or large cities like Cleveland or Detroit, 
shrinking is not shrink it's not the only thing that's a challenge in these cities but it's a major force in terms of creating the difficulties that these cities are facing and again this could expand so the question is and this is the crux of the point is it inevitable that American peripheral cities, secondary cities, whatever we might want to call them, the hinterland, if, are going to simply decline and wither away, or is there hope? <coughs> and I believe there's hope. And I believe the hope lies not in trying to desperately latch onto or hold onto what vestiges of global economic activity you can hold on to, but lies in accepting the realities of change and forging a new business model for cities or city regions. And I'd like to talk just a few minutes about what I think that model might look like, because I call it networked localism. And the reason I came up with that term was that essentially, I think, the, the crux of urban futures outside the megacities and so forth lies in developing economies and societies that are much more integrated at the local level and less dependent on the global economy. Now, for those of you who are classical economists in the audience, your first reaction is going to be, oh, God, that was exploded 100 years ago by Ricardo or somebody. Well, first thing is we're dealing with a different environment. Second thing is, and this is why it's networked, that I truly believe that because of technologies that have emerged in, re in the last decades and are likely to continue to emerge, that the project of localism is far more viable today than it would have been 100 years ago or 75 or 50 years ago. And let me explain. So first thing is there are four pieces to this picture. And they're not, it's not entirely about the economy. In fact, the economy is critical, but it's not the necessarily the only thing. The first thing is to look at the environmental framework and look at how to create a localized environment which actually takes advantage of declining population and regional resources. And that could be a question of developing greater food security, greater localized food supply, all using vacant land in cities, as many cities are, as these examples show, using vacant land to enhance the environment, whether it's dealing with stormwater overflow, whether it's increasing quality of life, whether it's providing food, whether it's eliminating heat islands, using the resources of the locality to enhance the economic security and quality of life of the population. See, some of the people may rec recognize some of these. Which, the, the one in Riga? Yeah. The second, the second piece, again, is the economic framework. One of the things that I, as I was researching this, I find abso found absolutely amazing that you can buy for about $25,000, you can buy a box which you can put on a workbench. And if you have the right war raw materials, you can download the software to make almost anything you could imagine. From house parts, to prosthetic hands, to medical devices, to notebooks, and so forth. This technology, this combination of low low cost physical infrastructure integrated through software systems has created opportunities that are absolutely unbelievable and 
never existed until a, few, a couple of decades ago. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to make everything locally. You know, smartphones will probably be centralized if only because the supply chain requires materials that are not going to be available locally. Cars, airplanes, no. But most things that people in a region need can be made locally, and at this point, because of the technology, can be cost competitive with global and national systems. Same localized energy is a growing movement around the world. The plant in the picture is a biomass plant in a city called Shule in Lithuania, which provides 50% of the heat through a central heating system that covers the entire city, 50% of the heat that the city needs, plus 15% of its electricity. So remote work, of course, I don't even have to talk about. A third area is to rethink how a city operates in terms of its population and its health care. It's how cities relate to their older population. We have a lot to learn, by the way, from Japan, which has created systems of care and attention as well as maintain ensuring that they continue to be integrated in the local active workforce and society that put us to shame, frankly. Health care, learning, I can, again, I don't want to, I've already spent almost as much time as I plan to, so I have a little more to go, so I won't go into detail about this, but the opportunities for delivery of high quality health care as well as high quality education, especially higher education, through remote and hybrid methods have become extraordinary. And again, I found it amazing that if you, let's say somebody has a brain tumor in a small town in Kansas, and needs to be operated on immediately. Assuming the clinic in that town has certain equipment, that surgery can be performed by the top brain surgeon in Chicago sitting in her office. The, te that, the technology is there. Now, I think people are a little hesitant about doing that, if, but I would be. But the fact is the technology is very good. There's a whole question of people's readiness to adopt technology, which is a complicated issue. And then finally, one of the things about change, significant systemic change, is nobody can simply order a community or a region to change. No mayor, county executive, bank president or anybody can simply say, we're going to change tomorrow because it's the right thing to do. You'll get to love it in time. You need to have, to, to make any of this happen, there has to be a participatory framework for the society, which includes everybody. You need strong neighborhoods. You need strong civic institutions. You need strong public places and a sense where pe places where people can get together and places where they can identify with their community. So it's not a simple process. In fact, it's, a compl it's an extraordinarily complicated process, the sort of thing that I'm describing, the kind of transition from where a city like Peoria is today, where they really don't have to think about any of these issues. People go to work at Caterpillar, the tankers come by to pick up the soybeans, life goes on. It's a difficult and traumatic change. And the question is, I think the biggest question is, can we get there? And I think there are a lot of challenges on the way. I think people are not happy with their existing conditions, and in some respects that's a starting point, but that's a very inadequate starting point. The will to change is needed, and then th we've got to overcome a lot of things to get there. But I believe 
that it's possible. I also believe, and I hope that other people will agree, that if you want to change, the time, the point at which you should start thinking about change is not the point where the crisis is already upon you. It's before the crisis is upon you, which means basically now. So with that thought, I will leave you and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Thank you. I'm going to grill you now on the book. So I wanted to start with a process question, which is, you know, you're reading the book and you talk about Latvia, you're talking about Bulgaria and Japan, and then you come back to the U.S. And I'm just curious, not only how many passport pages you got stamped, because it sounds like it was fun, quite a few, quite a few. Um, but if you could just talk a little bit about how you picked where you went and how you found people to talk to you and just what was that like? Okay, well, the first thing is, what started all of this, and this goes back maybe four or five years, when I had, I was looking, reading some stuff about, you know, demographic data, and about the big shift in population growth rates, and I sort of went, wow, that changes everything. And so that was really, it was that that really started me on it. And then, so I, then I, after I, so I started thinking about this in the cities, and then I talked to, before I'd done it much work at all, I, I talked to my, my editor at Island Press, wonderful person, and basically pitched the idea of a book about how cities are gonna respond to all of these changes. And she liked it, and I put together a proposal, and it went back to the, their editorial board, and she called me back and said, look, we like it, but we don't want a doom and gloom book about how everything is going to be terrible and it's all, we're all going to collapse and die. I, they want solutions. And I said, but I don't have any. She said, find some. <laughs> so the first thing, so that was the starting point. Why do I go to Latvia? Well, my mother's family is from Latvia, <laughs> but the but no, I think the, the, I started looking at a lot of those countries, both because sort of Eastern Europe has always fascinated me because that's where my roots are, but also because these are countries that are, along with Japan, and that are ahead of the curve, if you will, on population decline and shrinking cities. And what I was really interested in was trying to get a sense of how, how are they respect, responding to this? How are they dealing with the issues that they're confronting? Because they're all confronting issues around this. So that was really what prompted it. So basically last fall, not last fall, but a couple of years ago, as I was working on this book, I sort of, I decided to take what you might think of as a kick the tires tour. Because I, I have trouble operating consistently at 30,000 feet. And so I had to see this stuff and actually talk to people and look at it. And, and it turned out utterly fascinating. And basically what I found was in terms of getting people to talk to me, and again, most of the people who t I got to talk to and so forth were academics because they're the people who tend to be most likely to be open to talk to me. I was quite disappointed that for the most part, I had difficulty getting government officials to <coughs> respond to my inquiries and to talk to me. A, f a few here and there, but by and large, not. But I found, and again, I would say especially in countries like Romania, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and so forth, there's this extraordinary collection of young people who are very internationally minded, fortunately fluent in English because my Latvian is basically non-existent, and eager to share experiences with the rest of the world. And so I found that was extraordinarily productive. And then 
you know, then basically I just sort of slurped up information. And I hope the book doesn't come across as too much of a travelogue. No. <laughs> because, but I do think that having those, get, trying to give a sense of what these places are like and what they're trying to do adds a lot to the book. Yeah, so I think it's interesting that you said government, people in government were not so forthcoming or willing to talk to you. And I wanna bring us back to um, this idea that we were actually talking about before the talk tonight, um, is you talk about shrinkage in the context of capitalism and the constant pursuit of economic growth. And then you say that, you know, you put up these slides about change and how we need to think about changing and that no one can make people change. But since we're at a public policy institute, I want to talk about institutions, right? So it's interesting that government officials were kind of eh, about talking, but how can we start to get people within institutions to understand what's going on and, and think about change, specifically thinking about you know, people within institutions and you know, in New York we have all these institutions devoted to economic development. So what, is that, what does that change look like? It's <coughs> It's a fundamentally different mindset. I mean, we have, <coughs> we have become, and we think of it as distinctively American, but it really isn't. It goes way beyond the United States, fixated on growth. We see growth as a solution to our problems. We see growth as something that's almost an unquestioned good thing, capital G, capital T. And it's, you know, and I want to make it clear, I'm not in some deep set way anti-growth and saying this is a bad thing. I'm saying we have to get over it because it's going to go away. There are too many things going on in the world, too many trends going on that are going to work against it over the coming decades. We have to learn to live without it. <coughs> And this is a fundamental change in mindset. And I would, and it's very hard, you know, if you look at a, a city like Peoria, for example. Now, I don't know the, any of the local officials there, any of the people there, but I can imagine that if you went to them and said, this is the time where you should start thinking about how to make Peoria viable and healthy without Caterpillar. <laughs> They'd look at you like, you're crazy. We've always had Caterpillar. We will always have Caterpillar. And so I don't know what is really exactly how you light the spark. I think if I were 40 years younger, I'd try to organize some kind of a large scale you know, project, convince some foundation to give me millions of dollars so I could start going out and really talking this stuff and working with groups and working with people and institutions as if in cities. I think something like that would be wonderful. I, one thing that, you know, this struck me, it was, a, it was an interesting counterpart. In, in Germany, that one of the German states is North Rhine-Westphalia. It's actually about the same size and in many respects very similar in its demographic and e economic history to New York State. If you, it doesn't have a New York City, but it's about 18 million people. It's an <coughs> industrial state. It's old. It's a, well, the state of North Rhine-Westphalia has created a network of research and dissemination institutes designed to improve the, the thinking and the planning and the activities of gov local governments and businesses within the state. So there's one on immigrant integration. There's one on planning and transfer transportation and land use planning. There's one on nanotechnology. There's one on business process systems. They're all together 17 or 18 of these. And they go around, they do research, they go around, they talk to people, they work with people. This the state gives each one about a million euros a year for core funding, and then they can go out and raise additional money from foundations, from the federal government, from the EU, and so forth. 
Well, suppose New York State decided to do something like that. I mean, $18 million is a rounding error in the New York State budget. And so created a bunch of institutes <coughs> focusing on the different areas in which, up, especially upstate cities, could start thinking about change <coughs> and transformation and so forth. That, it would not be extraordinarily difficult, and I think it would be transformative. Somebody's got to start the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I could go on all night asking you questions, but I'd like to open it up to the audience, and Peter has the mic, so please wait for your mic. Why don't we start up here? Thank you, I'm Michael Myers, President of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question relates to how America is different from the country you're talking about. We're talking in America about the black-white situation, racial you, you change, speak, right? I don't hear as well oh, as okay. I wish I did, so this. America is different from the country you have talked about because we have a racial diversity issue. We have blacks in the inner cities and whites in the suburbs, and we have in the exurbs whites and blacks in segregated neighborhoods. So my question to you is, given the propensity in America for racial segregation and ghettoization, how do we get young people, who, for example, people who go to small colleges, who go to, who integrate black communities, how do we get young people to stay in the college towns where they, where they go to, in order to expand the integration set and so that we can get away from ghettoization and get higher education and government to produce integration in American society? Well, first, obviously, unless you have the will to do it, so forth, it, it's not gonna happen. But assuming there is some will to move in that direction. The first thing is, I think, the whole question of higher education outside of sort of the elite institutions and the major global centers like New York and so forth is in a, a crisis currently. And part of the problem is that the small colleges and universities in the smaller cities are hemorrhaging students especially, ironically, the community colleges, which so, and it's gonna get worse because currently they're hemorrhaging students even though the size of the age cohorts reaching college age have stayed about the same. In about five years, the size of the average cohort is gonna start going down and down and down and down. So we have a huge crisis there. Now, part of, what I see, and this is not a panacea, but what I would love to see is if, a, if, a, if say, a small city, now some of, some of these places may be beyond hope, especially in, in upstate New York back in the 60s, the state of New York planted colleges, universities in not small cities, villages, tiny villages, and I, I don't know, whether some of those, I think, are just going to have to disappear. It's gonna to be tough, but I think that's where it's heading. But I think in small cities, if you could, I think if we got away from the, we have a lockstep model of higher education. We have, you have community college is two years and you get an associate's degree. Undergrad is four years and you get a BA degree master's, PhD, it's all lockstep. Institutions are structured around producing certain products and so forth. If we got away from that and started to think about how to create a whole diversity of higher education options within the existing facilities, taking advantage of the technology. I mean, there's research that we know little kids do not thrive on remote education. We know that. But adults do okay. 
College age students go, okay, suppose we took those community colleges or small colleges and created education hubs, integrated them with major universities elsewhere so people could go to you know, your education hub and listen to the professor from Yale or Berkeley or whatever, and then start to see these not as, again, if you're 18, you do this. If you get your BA, you do that and so forth. But places for everybody in the community who wants to learn something. And again, I, how to do this specifically and so forth is get obviously complicated. And how to make sure that it's done in a way that integrates all of the people and the communities, racially, ethnically, educationally, and so forth in the community is, is difficult. But I think if you start with this idea of creating a flexible, very different model of higher education, I'd call it lifelong learning, except that term has been so misused <laughs> by so many different people over the last decades, I wouldn't go there. But if we can create a different model, I think that creates the opportunity for people who want to see you know, integration and people coming together in a community to actually do so, okay. which the current model doesn't. Okay. Gentleman here. I'd like to shine a light on two areas, uh, if I could. The first one is, there's a fellow named Vinoid. He's the founder of Sun Microsystems. He is building fusion electric generators something that the federal government in the United States said couldn't be done, and he's now building demonstrations of it. He founded, by the way, uh, OpenAI. Um, his wife is building what you're talking about, about these education cooperatives. And he's looking for people to get involved in these kinds of events from the ground up. Um, it exists. You have to see it in the small areas. And the biggest thing is in the United States, we have to own everything. We do not share. I talked to the CEO of uh, Volkswagen at a conference, and he said, you know, you're not gonna own an automobile, at least not in the rest of the world. But in the United States, automobile ownership is something you refuse to give up. It's going to be share cars, and it's gonna come with trucks first and cars second, all right? The other thing I like to shine a light on is the success story, another success story and that is the country of Denmark. In my research, I started to look at the happiest countries according to the United Nations, Denmark, Sweden, and asked the question, why has a country like Denmark gone from a country where only 62% of the people thought the government was doing a good job to 93%? Because they picked the problem and then gave it back to the people of the country to solve. And they came here to New York to talk to the mayor of New York City, and were basically told that will never work here. Do experiments. Don't be afraid to try things. That's what these great entrepreneurs are doing, and they're doing it around the world. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I think this isn't something that's going to happen by the, any national, certainly not the United States government, or any large national government saying this is where we've got to go. It's going to happen through local, regional experiments. I think there, there are other success stories. There are examples. I mentioned a couple of them. There are people in the Netherlands building a new subdivision of houses entirely constructed in one of those desktop CNC machines. There, Ithaca, New York, is actually working on maximizing local food production and food security in Tompkins County. The, so Burlington, Vermont is now, all of its electricity is coming from renewable sources and 50% of that is local. And so there are people doing bits and pieces and I think that at least provides some hope. Of course, you think about places like Ithaca and Burlington, and these are places that are A, relatively affluent, B, 
be full of people with highly skilled people with PhDs and technical qualifications and so forth, but it has to start somewhere. Nick? Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Liz. Um, I want to probe a little bit about the institutional question, Liz, that you were getting at earlier. Um, maybe bring it back to uh, a, a meso region of New York State. Uh, I, I, I'm curious when you look at, you know, you mentioned political will. When, you, when we look at different levels of government and different forms of institutions, where you think the action could be? Because, you know, there we have the local level, and certainly a lot happens at the local level. Uh, we have the federal level, and certainly the media gives all of its attention to the federal level. Uh, but we have a third state, a third level of government in the United States and in many other uh, countries around the world. Uh, what's the relationship there look like between uh, the state of New York, which has had a lot of, uh, a lot of tries at, at this over the years, especially the last 10 years with the regional economic development councils, et cetera. Where do you see, where do you see this kind of political will manifesting usefully and where, where are the levers that can, can be pushed or pulled? I think the states are potentially tremendously important in this picture. Now, I think New York State is actually a pretty good example. They have, New York State probably does more in terms of trying to fund economic development, economic growth, all that sort of thing at the local and regional level than perhaps any other state, certainly any other state that I'm familiar with. And I think if you had a state government that was thinking about these issues, that they could become a catalyst. Ultimately, they couldn't do it, but they could create an environment in which local governments would start to see how they can do this and provide them with resources and tools. You know, it's not like we're talking about a city would need billions of dollars to do this sort of stuff. This stuff is actually, for the most part, relatively low compared to the cost of bringing a chip factory to Syracuse, for example, or something like that. This is really low cost stuff. So if you've got a state that was really bought into this, saying, you know, saying, how can you, what is the future for New York State, especially upstate? And how can we as a state help in the inevitable transition that our cities are going to be going through? If you just had that, that could become a have a catalytic effect. Great. I think we have time for one final question. The woman here. Can you wait for the mic? He's coming. thought that the population in the world was going to get to 10 billion. I don't know how you got to that number or why, uh, but um, um, global warming is going to be much more effective than uh, waiting for people to um, have less children or hoping that women get jobs. I think it's a much more, we're much more in a crisis than that. Uh, uh, let me say that I agree with you, that growth has to be the other way. We can't grow, we have to get smaller, we have to live on a planet that will support the, the water and the land and everything that people live on, um, that, that they have to live on. And then, uh, since you're talking about New York State, um, you're thinking that big cities are gonna to go to small cities, but in New York State, in, in here, it's just the opposite. Everything that happens, any kind of growth, any reason, is always that New York City has to be bigger. It would be much better if some of the things that we want would go into cities like uh, Poughkeepsie, nice little cities in the west, or the, uh, in the north, but the whole uh, direction of growth now is here in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
is like the opposite of what you want. Right? But uh, even more serious than that is that I feel that um, you think that the cities will get smaller. If you haven't got a population control, if you haven't got some idea about it, the parts of the world that are having too many children are sending the immigrants here. And so we're getting, again, we're not getting a smaller country, we're not getting, getting to the conditions of lower growth, it's getting bigger. It's getting more, more warlike too. Yeah, first, I think, I mean, there are reasons why New York City is growing. I mean, New York City is a mega city. It is a magnet. It is an economic magnet. It is one of a relatively small number of global cities that have unique characteristics. And people are going to continue to flock to New York City. And it's, what I try to do is separate out, to be very careful about setting, separating out what I think is likely to happen versus from what I might want to happen. Because what I want to happen is totally irrelevant to the way the world is going to operate. The world is going to do what it's going to do regardless of what I want. And what I see as far as I can understand from everything I understand about e economics and migration and what have you, New York City will continue to grow. And New York City had better figure out a way to accommodate growth in a way that is reasonably equitable and decent and ensures that the immigrants, whether they're coming from Peoria or from Luanda, have a decent opportunity in to improve their, their condition in life. I think that's New York City's job. It can't shrink that responsibility. Sa now, a certain number of people will undoubtedly move to Poughkeepsie and have been moving to Poughkeepsie and Kingston and so forth, taking advantage of the fact that they only have to be in New York City two or three days a week and so forth. And that's, f that's good for Kingston and Poughkeepsie. But it's not going to help Syracuse or Utica or Rochester or Buffalo. So all of these places are going to have to figure out, again, not so much what they want to happen as what the forces that are operating in the world are pushing them towards. Because, you know, again, it's this, Syracuse, which it's, it's interesting, this is a bit of a digression, but I think it's relevant. I, I, I gave a lecture in Syracuse about a month ago and now, if you talk to the public officials of Syracuse, as many of you may know, a Micron, which is one of the major gl global chip manufacturers, has committed to building a humongous chip factory right outside of the city of Syracuse. And pretty, you talk to the mayor, you talk to the county executive, talk to these people and say, they're, ta they're, they're talking like, our future is guaranteed. The rich uncle has shown up and showered us with largesse, to which I said, but very politely, I didn't use this term, bullshit. <laughs> and I, I said, this, it's an opportunity, but it's not gonna change anything fundamental. And it's not gonna change the fact that you've got a 30% poverty rate and you've got extraordinary racial inequities, and et cetera, et cetera. It is an opportunity that might help you, but if you decide that it's gonna solve your problems, and you don't have to focus on the fact that you've got a high poverty rate, and you've got vacant housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're gonna be right back where you started. But I was nicer about it than that, I didn't <laughs> I? But, I think that's the point. You've got to, you know, we have to be realistic. We have to be very, now, you could say that some of the stuff I've talked about is simply not realistic in terms of the solutions. Maybe it isn't. It's difficult, certainly. But I think we have to be realistic about what the options are and about where we're going. And now, I don't think, I don't think there is any reason 
I, I think overall, the fact that population growth in the world is slowing down and will probably eventually reverse is probably on balance a good thing be for all kinds of environmental reasons and so forth. Whether population, whether the having the United States population decline is a good thing is a very different question. I don't, given the fact that the United States is extraordinarily well positioned to thrive in the midst of the coming crises, it's the only country in the world that is both self-sufficient in agriculture and self-sufficient in energy. It is the least export dependent of any major industrial country. You can go to, we, there is no, you know, I, I understand the politics, but from a larger environmental economic reason, there is no reason why the United States should not continue to grow by taking in millions of immigrants from parts of the world which are going to be hit with disastrous effects. There are parts of, cent of South America, West Africa, and others that are going to be desertifi desertified, if I'm pronouncing that right, as a result of climate change. There are gonna be million, millions of people for decades have been moving from north to south br in Brazil. Millions of people are desperate to get leave West Africa because you know, there is no means of sustenance. The, and, and it'll get worse because of the climate shifting. So the point is, there is no reason why the United States should not accommodate millions of people from the rest of the world because we are in a far better position to provide them with opportunity and a decent way of life than sadly the countries from which they came for no fault of their own. So, <laughs> so all right. But, but I can give you your soapbox back now. <laughs> no, I think we'll have to end it there. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. And um, just a note, there are books for sale upstairs, and Alan will be on deck to sign them. And Thank you very much.